The President, please be seated. The court is now in session. Mrs. Saikalwati is now instructed to report on the attendance of the parties to the proceedings today. Saikalwati, Mr. President, the parties to the proceedings today are all present. Toutes les parties sont présentes. Alors, The security personnel are now instructed to take the accused to the dock. Au camp des accusés. In the moment, the chamber would like to give the floor to the prosecutors to make their rebuttal statement if they would wish to do so. Please be informed that uh, the prosecutors will have one hour to make such statement. You may now proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Good morning, Your Honours. Bonjour, Good morning, Learned Council, civil parties, Confrères, avocats, member of the, civils, members of the public, and people of Cambodia. Your Honours, today we have a very short time to respond to quite a number of things, so we will be brief on the topics and try and lead you to the evidence through our briefs. I briefly will give an introduction on some remarks we would like to make, and then I'll hand the floor to my national colleague who will address a number of issues, and following that I will address a few more. Your Honours, the prosecution takes great exception to the remarks by the defence made yesterday that we have been representing this case by untruth, stating things that are not based on the evidence. And in relation to that, Your Honours, I would invite Your Honours to look at the final submission that we filed back in 2008, prior to the indictment being issued. Look at that 200-page final submission with all of those footnotes. Look at the opening and the address of the prosecution at the start of this case. And look at the final submission with 1,000 footnotes. 160 pages, which supports everything we have said about this case from the beginning until the end. The prosecution case has been clear and it's been consistent, and we invite your honours to scrutinise these claims by the defence by actually looking at the evidence rather than rhetoric. And perhaps. Um, one brief example of the absolute inaccuracy of the defence comments. Your Honours will remember yesterday when the defence stated that in this brief, in the prosecution's final submission, there wasn't one word, one sentence acknowledging the limited cooperation that uh, this accused has given. We have said that. We stand by that. It's limited cooperation, and he should receive some minimal credit for that. And we've explained that to your honours in our sentence. 
If Your Honours look to si ainsi, page 6 <coughs> of our final brief, and I'll read, the accused has agreed to the facts of most of the underlying crimes, except his overall responsibility and generally cooperated with the authorities and offered his apologies to the victims and their families. These are important concessions which should have a mitigating factor on his sentence if he is convicted. We said that in our brief, and Defence Council yesterday stated that not a word was there. That, those comments about prosecution untruths, that relates to so many other aspects of this case, and by looking at the footnotes, Your Honours, you'll see that's completely and utterly inaccurate. Secondly, Your Honours, what has happened, though, in this trial is that, Your Honours, the prosecution, the civil parties have been grossly misled by the defence. Two weeks ago, they filed a brief which had nothing in it in relation to evidence of uh, mitigating circumstances. And sure, they don't have to put anything in the brief. It's not their job to prove the case. However, it's been particularly unhelpful only hearing what the defence's position in relation to the evidence is yesterday. But we're not complaining about that. What we are complaining about is that that throughout this trial and through this brief, they've generally been accept, accepted that they're going to be pleading guilty to these charges. Now, under the, under the civil law system, you know, there's no such thing as a guilty plea. But they have been saying throughout this case that certainly they would not be asked for an acquittal. And that's what they've done yesterday. They've asked for an acquittal for this accused, for a man that says he's cooperating with the authorities. That's loud and clear. So what does it mean? I think one thing that needs to happen today is that this needs to be rectified. It needs to be rectified whether or not this accused instructed his counsel to ask for an acquittal. As Your Honours are well aware, counsel can only act on instructions of their client. If counsel makes submissions on an acquittal when he, he in fact, wanted to acknowledge the crimes and plead guilty, then the counsel is leaving his client behind. And that's improper conduct. And, Your Honours, the reason why it's important because we will act on the assumption that the accused has instructed the defence to ask for an acquittal. Now, if that's the case, he should get no, no mitigating factors in relation to a sentence. None at all. Because that's not cooperation at all. So that's the assumption that we make. But I have a feeling, I have a feeling that that's not the case. I have a feeling that counsel have acted without instructions. And I think, Your Honours, this needs to be resolved before we leave the courtroom. Because if we don't resolve this point, either the accused is going to be shortchanged, where he'll lose any mitigation that we put forward, and then he will appeal this case and say, my counsel didn't act on my instructions and we'll go through this again. Or alternatively, if Your Honours just assume that the counsel didn't act on instructions and the accused is in fact not pleading not guilty and ple pleading guilty, then you may, in fact, be giving him credit for something he's instructed his counsel not to do. So, Your Honours, this is very important for sentencing. And I would ask, and my suggestion would be, that uh, this accused be asked first, rather than their counsel, as to whether or not he's instructed them to plead not guilty or, in, in practical terms, 
to ask this bench for an acquittal, that affects the mitigating factors, whether they're present or not. And, Your Honours, it will also avoid an appeal point which the accused may raise. Secondly, Your Honour, in relation to what was the substance of the uh, acquittal submission, Obviously, the defence has said there was no personal jurisdiction for the accused. He's not a most responsible. He's also said, the defence has also said that he shouldn't be prosecuted because he's got an amnesty. He's also said that uh, there's no material jurisdiction for national crimes. The defence has also said there's no evidence for the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. And the defence have also said that uh, there's a full de defence of uh, committing these crimes because he was obeying superior orders. Now, the International Council <coughs> supported his National Council by saying, yes, yes, things have changed and uh, my client pleads not guilty. And then the International Council continues on and provides submissions on pleas of mitigation. It's very, very unclear what the defence are in fact doing. But one thing that is clear is that from that defence yesterday they asked for an acquittal of this accused. And I I strongly suggest, Your Honours, that you speak directly to the accused and find out whether they were acting on instructions or not. Your Honours, um, the fact that this change of approach by the defence on the second to last day of the trial, this is unacceptable in any courts and it should be unacceptable in this court. However, regardless of the submissions uh, the defence and the prosecution soit, make, Your Honour, uh, Your Honours have heard the evidence, you can make your, mind, your own minds up on the evidence. Your Honours, my learned colleague um, will be addressing you briefly on the issue of uh, the question of whether the accused is the most responsible si est, uh, under, the, under the statute. I will briefly address the issue of uh, amnesty. Amnesty clearly doesn't apply. The ECC law takes away any amnesty that could apply. And even if it wasn't for the ECC law, amnesty wouldn't apply for this accused in any event. There's no need to go into that. Those matters uh, should have been raised one month after the indictment was issued, which is probably about a year and a half ago a year and a half late on the day before the end of the trial. That's Rule 89, Your Honours. My colleague will address the matter of uh, national crimes, whether they should apply that was raised by the defence. And in relation to the defence raised, a full defence raised of superior orders to these crimes, Article 29 clearly states that uh, committing crimes via superior orders, in fact, there's no defence, and that reflects the, uh, the international jurisprudence in relation to crimes against humanity and war crimes. Your Honours, I'll hand the floor to, to my learned counsel. Um, I will then come back and say a few words about the plea of mitigation, bearing in mind it was in the context of a defence request for a complete acquittal Étant entendu que cette Thank demande you. de circonstances d'étudiants s'inscrit dans un contexte de plaidoyer pour l'acquittement. Uh, Mr. President, with your leave, a, a small Karim uh, Monsieur intervention, le Président, si vous if they may have uh, permission. Uh, Your Honours, the prosecution have Madame proposed juge, quite sensibly in the submission of Civil Party Group 1 a preliminary a preliminary issue uh, that a question be put from the bench to the accused in order to have clarity. Your Honour, it's my respectful submission for the proper conduct of proceedings that instead of ploughing straight on uh, with uh, the rebuttal of the prosecution uh, facing a very uncertain picture, the more prudent and efficient course 
would be, if we are honest, to consider the preliminary application of the prosecution uh, and decide whether or not to put the question to the accused. It may well be that once some clarity, either way, has been restored to these proceedings, then more fruitful and more focused submissions can be put forward by the prosecution. If we do not adopt this approach, of course the danger is that after all the prosecution submissions facing an uncertain a case put forward by the defence, there is no opportunity to have any additional submissions. So, Your Honours, it is my um, respectful submission that in the uh, interest of justice, uh, Your Honours, decide the preliminary matter now before we proceed further. Your Honours, I'm most grateful and I do apologise for interrupting. The President, uh, the Chamber would like to give the floor now to the National the Co Prosecutor to make a rebuttal statement. Mrs. Chia Ling, Mr. Mr. President, Président. Your Honours, Madame, Messieurs les Juges. I will be trying to respond uh, to the Defence Council concerning the comments made uh, by them regarding S21. As I already, uh, we already indicated earlier, the role of the prosecutors is to find justice for the victims uh, of the Khmer Rouge regime based on the law and the facts. Yesterday, the Defence Council indicated that the trial would not be used as a venue for revenge, but it was used for seeking justice. The question is, did the crimes exist at S21? And if they existed, who would be responsible for them? And we, the prosecutors, have to find evidence to support these arguments. And, uh, it is the important role of our office to find all the evidence for the interests of the public and the victims. However, it is quite contradictory uh, to this notion that the Defense Council only brought forward the exculpatory evidence. It is very interesting that uh, after Et having heard uh, the submission of the Defence Council, we have doubt uh, that uh, the accused had already acknowledged all the crimes committed at S21, but the Defence Council has not uh, touched upon the crimes at S21 and that uh, they maintain that uh, Deutsche shall not be liable for the crimes committed at S21. So their statements are very contradictory. And we would like to also ask questions whether it is the genuine statement or submission by the Defense Council to uh, reduce the sentence uh, of the Et accused si when he is found guilty or to la, acquit la all the crimes he had committed. During the preliminary hearing, uh, the initial hearing, initiale, there was a contest uh, in relation to the penal court of 1956. However, according to our internal rule, Rule 87.2, such uh, submission shall not be raised now uh, since the time allowed already elapsed. I still have another passé. question, and I would like to also make it clear why this person falls into the jurisdiction of the ECCC and why he is among the most responsible person of uh, those who were uh, the senior leaders uh, of the Khmer Rouge regime. Before this hearing, the Defense Council made uh, in their statement yesterday that uh, 
According to the criminal or the penal code of 1956, article 109, the defense stated that the Statute of limitation has already lapsed. The Penal Code of 1956 indicates uh, the statute of limitation of any crime which uh, is in the scope of 10 years. And the crime was committed uh, from the beginning until the 1979, so the jurisdiction, uh, the, the statute of limitation of such crime was uh, within 10 years, within the legal framework of or the jurisdiction of the court to uh, put the accused uh, on trial. So Donc, nous dit la défense, il est later on, after some amendments and agreement, uh, then the statute of limitation has been extended to 30 years and another 10 years. <coughs> and the defense counsel requested or indicated that uh, the défense, murder or the torture as prescribed uh, in articles 500, 501 and 506 of the Penal Code of 1956 uh, already overdue uh, concerning its statute of limitation. And they also submitted that uh, article 19, uh, rather article 500, 501 and 506 of the Criminal Penal Code of 1956 uh, should not be uh, applied uh, before the chamber. However, the Toutefois, prosecutors found that uh, the laws are applicable. Relève. And the reason uh, why the extension, why the statute of limitation is extended is because parce que le délai de prescription a été allongé. that Article 500 and 501 and 503 are not uh, violating the principle of legality. Par ailleurs, il n'y a pas violation du and this de legal, uh, the principle of legality is prescribed in Article 15 of the ICCPR. Article 15 du Pacte international relatif aux droits civils et politiques. And the extension of the statute of limitation concerning the Penal Code of 1956 has nothing to do with the alteration of the crimes as charged. Uh, this extension of the statute of limitation allows the authority le, le or the juri uh, give the jurisdiction to the ECCC to bring to trial those people who were most responsible and who were the senior Democratic Kampuji regime and those who were rem responsi uh, responsible for the murders and tortures. Et notamment pour ce qui est des personnes responsables de meurtre, d'homicide et de torture. It is not against the principle of non-retroactivity. Retroactivity means that the crimes committed, uh, but the law was adopted later. La loi uh, été adoptée après la the Penal Code of 1956 uh, was already adopted uh, before the crimes were committed. La commission des crimes. It is obvious that uh, Deutsch, who Et was well educated, uh, could have well been familiar with uh, the existence of such law. So the accused uh, must have known the laws before the crimes were committed. Avant même que les crimes ne soient commis. On top of that, the magnitude of the crimes committed by the accused, including murder, torture, torture, which were systematic, which were inflicted on to more than 12,000 detainees at S21, were foreseeable. 
L'ampleur donc des crimes était prévisible. Et c'est vrai que les accusés pouvaient avoir connu clairement que les actes étaient de criminal in nature because he made it clear that uh, he was quite familiar with the criminality of the Khmer Rouge uh, regime by way of evacuating people gradually from the cities and have them moved and forced uh, to labor in the rural areas. So we submit that Kang Kek Iu alias Doche had pre-knowledge of the murder and torture which were prescribed in the criminal, uh, the penal code of 1956 and uh, penal de the law which was based uh, uh, for the uh, when he was being charged. So we conclude Dutch. that uh, there is no violation of Nous the non-retroactivity rétroactivité n'a été commise when the criminal code of 1956 is referred to eu égard au code de pénal de 1956 article 3 of the ECCC law de la loi relative au CETC and based on the spirit of the negotiation between the royal government of Cambodia and the United Nations, some national or domestic crimes have been included into the agreement. Finally, the royal government of Cambodia and with the approval of the National Assembly of Cambodia agreed to extend the statute of limitation of the crime to another 30 years. We would wish the trial chamber to also review the decision by the Constitutional Council, which was dated in 2001. The decision dated in the same year, there were two decisions of the Constitutional Council in relation to the extension of the statute of the limitation concerning the penal code of 1956. And this decision has already been well put in Article 3 of the ECC law. The decision is final and the appeal is not subjected. This shows a strong purpose of the lawmakers and the drafters of the law which wish, who wish to include uh, these crimes into the rules before the ECCC and that uh, the, these laws are to be applied for the crimes committed uh, during the Khmer Rouge regime. So the law before the ECC is not contradictory to the decision made by the Constitutional Council. I would like now to touch upon the point, uh, the decision made uh, by the pretrial chamber. Having ceased of the appeal de by the co-prosecutor to include uh, murder and torture uh, torture within the framework of the Penal Code of 1956 to include these crimes the into uh, the ECC law, and these matter have already been Dans prescribed in Article 3 of the ECCC law, and the pretrial chamber has already ruled ETC. on this uh, matter with the decision majority question. decision to include uh, domestic uh, crime, including murder and torture. According to rule 89, sub-rule 2, the trial chamber shall only make a decision or rule on the facts 
which been listed uh, in the indictment or the decision by the pretrial chamber. The trial chamber has the jurisdiction to rule on the matters as uh, listed in the indictment as I already submitted. So the trial chamber is uh, or has the jurisdiction to decide or to rule on the matters that have already been listed in the indictment. Uh, Mr. Kassel was already indicated that uh, why Dutch alone was liable for the crimes while the other chiefs of detention facility is still at large. The defense counsel maintained that uh, their client was just like a scapegoat. Such an argument uh, is not Or does not make any sense because uh, if the defense counsel relied on the facts, on the ev ample evidence put before the chamber, then they should never have come up with the term scapegoat uh, that they would like to describe uh, for the accused. I would like to quote uh, the case of Lubanga before the ICC. The accused uh, maintained that. Uh, uh, la défense de Lubanga a fait valoir When Lubanga surrendered uh, before the court, uh, then it was uh, accused that uh, he only pretend to, uh, or he was the scapegoat. Uh, however, if we look at the case of the accused here, whether he should be called the scapegoat, uh, but the accused in this crime was not the scapegoat, and we, the co-prosecutors, would like the chamber to look at the accused before our chamber. In these proceedings, the trial chamber only looks into the facts of S21, and the chamber is not looking at all the crimes committed all across the country during the Democratic Cambodia. From the crimes committed at S21, it, and according to the indictment, and the decision made by the pretrial chamber, all the crimes related to S21 have been well listed uh, and forwarded to the trial chamber. The facts concerning S21 are substantiated uh, by the ample evidence because there are several victims, uh, including Cambodian nationals uh, and uh, the foreigners who were detained and smashed. All of them had endured uh, severe tortures and inhuman acts before they perished. The accused himself already acknowledged that such facts existed at S21 and that he is solely liable before the victims. And he said, uh, and it is found out in the evidence and his statement Et that uh, he said he was the deputy chairman and later on the chairman of the S21. He already sought uh, or pleaded guilty for the crimes he committed. The accused uh, 
was among the most senior leaders and most respons uh, responsible people for the crimes because he was among those who committed Ainsi, such crime, including the arrest, uh, the torture, crimes. and the execution. Arrêté, uh, and all enemies et, uh, all across the country were et executed, as we already noted in relation to the policy noté, of the uh, CPK, all security system. PCK. In the whole country, the, the security system was the core part of the structure of the Khmer Rouge, and S21 was the very important prison or structure. Although there is no evidence to prove that uh, S21 did not control at the detention qui, facility, uh, but it is clear S21 that S21 is or was the main security center in the whole country, which had uh, the direct contact uh, with the standing committee. This center provided uh, the advice and recommendation to the superior in relation to uh, the perceived enemies. This office was the sole office uh, in charge of arrests, interrogation, and execution of the senior cadres of the CPK. This office was in charge of the arrest and torture and execution of the senior ministers from ministries and senior cadre from all zone sectors. The center was used as the tool to purge internal staff or members. This document can be found uh, under document E2-41. Deutsch himself initiated, supported uh, the arrest and the smash. And he ordered under his supervision uh, several executions. The superior would not be familiar with uh, who Un would have been considered as enemies if Deutsch did not really tip off uh, such si uh, incidents. Pas attiré de ses sur ces and Deutsch maintained that he had good contact with his superiors. Et, uh, so Deutsch was the one who made the decision on Donc the fate of the detainees at S21. The, the statement is very contradictory to the Defense Council yesterday, who said that uh, the accused has no authority to make any arrest. According to Hem Hoi's statement, the 19-4, Hoi said that uh, the accused sometimes went to arrest uh, in person. S21 was the only security center of the Democratic Cambodia which has the huge operational scope. Its scope covered the operation all across the country. This center received prisoners from all ministries, including the Ministry of Public Affairs, the Energy uh, Industry, the Foreign Affairs, and the Social Affairs. This office used uh, its resources extensively and used it very skillful skills to make arrests of the detainees uh, during the regime. So S21 security office was the biggest security office within the regime. Having compared the staff member of each 
detention facility during the regime. S21 had the most people under its supervision. Some Westerners who were arrested from the coastal area of Sihanoukville were also sent straight to S21. Those people were not sent to any other autonomous prisons in the Sihanoukville vicinity. So it is clear that S21 had uh, the most authority compared to other prisons. The uniqueness of S21 already inflect, uh, reflects its complexity because this security center was only was designed to focus on searching for the enemies of the, the regime because the Democratic Cambodia found out that enemies were posing great threat to the regime and that the center was designed to track down, on the, uh, track down these uh, enemies. And the operation was very confidential. Even the security guards within the vicinity were not allowed to go beyond their confined allocated uh, or designated uh, Area for guards. Everyone who was detained at S21 was terrified because of the policy of secrecy. The accused aided and abetted and helped manage the smooth operation of S21, and his uh, contribution has led to the great destruction and great ex uh, execution at the vicinity. I do not know why Mr. Kang, uh, Mr. Kassavut uh, claimed that uh, his client was not reliable or responsible for the crimes uh, which have been committed uh, onto the victims at S21 and why his client was not uh, the most responsible person because uh, he said that his client only received order to kill or he would be killed. And he maintained that uh, his client was not uh, among the senior leaders. This argument was just like just an excuse. Les arguments qui ont été présentés this sont en accused fait person un prétexte. is a real criminal and Cette he is behind the crimes committed at S21. He was the secretary of S21 who oversaw all the administration, the management of the whole function of the Center. Et de tout le fonctionnement du centre. It proves that uh, the accused uh, was the most Cela senior person among the other people who were most responsible for the crimes during the jurisdiction of the ECCC. Uh, Finally, de la I would like to also talk about uh, the existence of armed conflicts. The Defense Council stated armé. that uh, the accused uh, had no knowledge of the armed conflicts before the 31st of December 1977. It is a false argument because the accused uh, indicated that he learned from Son Sen about uh, the armed conflicts at the border with Vietnam at the in the vicinity of Mondulkiri province. And that uh, Son Sen had to go to the Son battlefield uh, on the 15th of August 1977, and the accused were familiar with this. We would like to draw your attention to document E2 slash 30.1 and the ERN 00339830.
Sonsen went to the battlefield before the 15th of August 1977 and uh, Nunchi ordered Dutch and uh, briefed him on this. William Smith, uh, my co-colleague, uh, already put question to the accused uh, regarding this matter, and the accused uh, still agreed uh, with his statement or stand by his statement before the co-investigating judges. Although the accused uh, did not remember when exactly the armed conflict uh, existed, but uh, through the arrest of the Vietnamese prisoners of war at S21 in early 1976, the accused could have been familiar already, and more prisoners of war were arrested in February 1976 when they were found coming into the territory of Cambodia in Sector 25. The accused received those prisoners and he also summarized the confession of those prisoners. In his work to summarize uh, two confessions of the two Vietnamese prisoners of war, de, uh, he was quite familiar guerre, with uh, the intention of those uh, prisoners who came into Cambodia. Yesterday, during the hearing, uh, the hier, day before yesterday, at the end, uh, the accused un, un, expressed his remorse and said he uh, would be responsible for all the crimes before the victims. Euh, but it is quite contradictory that uh, uh, to, to the statement because uh, the accused uh, was not genuine in his expression of remorse uh, but we acknowledge that uh, the accused uh, cooperated uh, with the chamber but that it is uh, his statement that he maintained he is responsible for all the crimes. He is responsible for the crimes uh, in legal and emotional context. If the accused has a responsibility moral still maintain his genuine position si that uh, uh, he sa position, keeps cooperating with the court si and expressing his genuine remorse, et si then de remorse the victims sincère, would probably alors, accept his apologies. Les victimes accepteraient sans doute euh, les excuses présentées. I would like to now give the floor to my co-colleague to add uh, the final point. Thank you, Your Honours. Your Honours, the, the defence in their submission yesterday basically put forward uh, indirectly that uh, this accused, well firstly of course, that he should be acquitted, secondly, if he's not acquitted but convicted, uh, the International Council have put forward a, a penalty range of about 17 to 20 years of imprisonment for this accused, bearing in mind the huge scale of crimes and the atrocious way in which they were committed and the pain and cruelty suffered by so many, that would be a completely and utterly inadequate response. It would not reflect what international jurisprudence um, states 
about accused that commits crimes of such a large scale. Your Honours, in support of that personnes. request, the defence put forward two cases, the case of Abrenovich and Albert Speer. La défense a utilisé Your Honours, I worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former et, Yugoslavia, uh, and I know about that case of Abrenovich, and it is completely and utterly different to the case uh, of this accused. In, in that case, Abrenovich was a military officer of very good character prior to the war, unlike this accused, who had been torturing and killing for about four years at M13. And you remember what Francois Bizot said on Christmas Eve in 1971, when he said, who does the beating? And the accused said to him, I can't stand their duplicity. I beat them. I beat them so I'm out of breath. Abranovich was not that person. He was an upstanding military officer. And then he got involved in crimes in the Bosnian War. The crimes that he was charged with was in relation to the Srebrenica massacre, where 8 to 10,000 people were killed in a large-scale military operation that happened over a three-day period. And certainly Abranovich wasn't the instigator of that operation, but the way the judges explained it, he played a passive role by allowing his men to be involved in that operation in the, in the fixed of war. That, in addition to that, Abrenovich allowed the investigators into his office and uh, to actually investigate the case against him on the case files, which is quite different to this accused. Your Honours, this accused crimes lasted for about three and a half years at over 12,000 victims, probably 13 or 14,000 as we've heard. It just cannot be compared at all with the case of Abrenovich. In fact, if you look at Abrenovich, it would probably guide your honours to give him triple the sentence that Abrenovich got. Secondly, they compare this accused to the uh, accused Albert Speer. And the difference between this accused and Albert Speer is that this accused was a loyal, enthusiastic implementer of the regime's policies. He wanted to do it. But uh, Albert Speer was someone quite different. The defence keeps stating that these types of crimes that uh, this accused committed are the crimes that all of us would commit. Ordinary people in his shoes would have committed. But ordinary people don't commit these types of crimes. And certainly, in relation to Albert Speer, Speer, he had a conscience. And it stated in the decision, and I quote, dans la décision, et je cite, in mitigation, it must be recognized that Spears' establishment of blocked industries did keep many laborers in their homes, and that in the closing stages of the war, he was one of a few men who had the courage to tell Hitler that the war was lost and to take steps to prevent the senseless destruction of production facilities, both in occupied territories and in Germany. He carried out his opposition to Hitler's scorched earth program in some of the Western countries and in Germany by deliberately sabotaging it at considerable personal risk. Clearly, Your Honours, this is the complete opposite in relation to this accused who, and we stand by it along with the experts, sent a web of terror throughout Cambodia by implicating many, many people through torture, knowing that, and on his words, 90 per cent were innocent. La torture, alors qu'il a dit lui-même et qu'il le savait que 90 per cent de ces personnes. Stephen Hessel was called as uh, by the defense Hessel, uh, a comparu dans ce to show how de la défense, reconciliation should influence la réconciliation um, nationale your sentencing considerations. However, in the cases of this type of accused, his view was that there must, there must be justice, proper justice, before there's any chance of real reconciliation. And I quote, this is Stefan Hessel, I shall take the example of Albert Speer. 
This example is something close to my heart because of his positive action towards those unhappy people, unfortunate people in the Dora concentration camp where I ended the Second World War. Mr. Mr. Speer assured that it was important to take into account the unbearable working conditions of those who were deported in the camp. So in his favour, he took a stand which enabled the Nuremberg judges to be less harsh on, harsh on him than they were in regard to the other accused before the court. I do not think that the same shall apply to a person who has admitted guilt, but who has not provided clear materials to support the view that he opposed the instructions that he received when he committed his deadly crimes. Clearly, the case of Albert Speer is completely different to the case of this accused in that he obje objected in the end to the policies, and secondly, he actually accepted his guilt which, uh, as we know from yesterday, subject to your clarification with the accused, um, this accused, although he says he psychologically accepts it, he generally accepts accountability. However, as we heard in the pleas of mitigation from the defence, he was a small cog in the machine. He had no choice. He had to do it, and he tried, in fact, to minimize the, uh, the pain and the suffering. Your Honours, you heard, you heard the International Defence Council uh, read out the notebook that he put to Prat Khan, a witness in this case. And in that notebook, he basically stated that well, don't torture all the time, because if you torture all the time, you may not, uh, you may not get to the truth. And as a result of that, you should use discussions about politics to find out the truth of the matter so that you, in fact, don't get people that are falsely implicated. That notebook was used to, to infer that this accused somehow wanted to minimize, minimize the deaths and minimize the pain and suffering. That's completely at odds with the accused's testimony. The accused has testified that he would take the, torch, the interrogators in and train them and dare them to be cruel. And uh, as I've previously stated, he's also stated that his process of interrogations and collecting confessions enabled 90% of the names of the people that were referred to in those confessions to be innocent. And those confessions were sent forward to his superiors and more people were arrested and the terror multiplied emanating from S21. Your Honours, the defence um, at the end of the case, at the end of the, the evidence, on the 16th of September, in the final stages before any of the parties could clarify this particular Audience question, which was raised by Robert Petit at the beginning of the case, um, and he said to the accused, question, I think you remember, Petit, um, are you a man that enjoyed the trust of your superiors implemented in a devoted and merciless fashion? the persecution of the CPK in Cambodia. And Lorsqu the accused said, absolutely yes. Now, in our submissions earlier this week, um, this led some great doubt as to what he meant by that, because if he meant, as we said, that um, he willingly, believing in the CPK, carried out these crimes not under the threat of fear or not for the reason that they were orders, but because he believed in the basis of the orders, then he should state that, and he should state that clearly. They say that uh, the Defence Council has been complaining throughout this case about the use of uh, leading questions because it's a, a common law principle of cross-examination, and it's absolutely amazing. The classic leading question at the end of the case when no one can examine what that answer meant was led by the International Defence Council who was complaining about that information or evidence gathering technique. The reason why, of course, is because sometimes leading questions lead to 
very ambiguous answers. They suggest the answer to the accused or the witness, and as a result, they become un can become unreliable and less clarified further. Done it at a time when uh, no clarification could be made. Your Honours, we gave the accused that opportunity about two days ago to say to this court, to say to the people of Cambodia, yes, I committed these crimes, I committed them willingly, I committed them because I believed in the CPK, and I'm sorry for that. But what he's done, apart from denying all guilt through his counsel by saying, give me, a, give me an acquittal, which I, I doubt he said that, and hopefully your honours will clarify that. He's had his international counsel come and say he was a small cog in the machine. Your honours have seen all of the annotations in this case, encouraging torture, proposing arrest to the senior leaders. Please can I arrest this one? Please can I arrest that one? And then his international counsel seems to forget about the evidence that is a clear photograph of the state of mind of the accused back in 1975 to 1979. He chose not to take that opportunity to actually accept full and complete responsibility rather than just being someone forced to obey orders under complete terror. And I can only reiterate one of the last questions to the accused, and I think it completely undermines his case. He stated, La, second to last question by the prosecution. And what about your relationship to Sun Sen, the one that uh, the International Defence Council was putting forward yesterday, that there was no relationship with superior subordinate authority and that was it? And he said, and I ask your honours to look at the transcript, this is the question I've been waiting for. I've been waiting to tell the world that I had the utmost respect and faithfulness for Sun Sen. Now, Sun Sen is what the National Defence Council said was in his top 13 list of the most responsible people for the killings in the country. Sun Sen was the one that taught the accused, that brought him up through M13, brought him up through S21, who stayed with him for 15 years after S21. And the accused has the utmost respect and faithfulness to him? I mean, he's got to be joking. Because if he's not, if he's not joking, and I'm sure he's not, that proves with all of the other evidence. This is just a complete lie. And for some reason or another, he's coming to court to try and accept political or general responsibility. But he's not facing up to who he was back in 1975 to 1979. Your Honours, maybe, maybe in his final statement he might turn towards the civil parties. Maybe in his final statement he might turn towards them and say, yes, I did believe in the CPK. It was madness. I did terrible things, but I believed in it. I believed it was a means to an end. That's what the evidence says. That's what the hundreds and hundreds of annotations say. I ask your honours to look at them. That's the truth. How can you be proud of your boss that's told you to torture and kill for years on end? That was an invitation, a non-leading, 
an open, question clear, clear invitation clear to this accused, and he shut that door. The door that he says and his counsel says needs to be open to the victims. Why would they want to go through that door? Your Honours, this case is about Monsieur le Président, and Monsieur, over 12,000 people that were brutally tortured and murdered. To think of the experience of any one of them, of any one of them, with the eagerness and enthusiasm with which this accused committed those crimes, it cannot it cannot let you give him a light sentence, and we implore you that you do not come back with a sentence for less than 40 years. We, some civil parties have complained. Some civil parties have complained because their lives of their families and friends have been lost, and he gets 40 years, and they've been through this cruel suffering, and he gets something less than that. We understand that. However, as we've said at the beginning of the case, this is not about revenge. This is about respecting humanity, respecting the humanity of this accused, respecting the humanity of the victims at S21. And so the law has told us that because of that illegal detention, we must, we have to give a reduction because of that. That's the law that tells us that. And that will make this judgment something that is a judgment to be proud of rather than the ones handed down by the accused many years ago. In respect of the victims, in respect of Cambodia's future, in respect of the principle of no peace without justice, I would ask that you remember the victims of S21, and as we said at the beginning, allow your judgment to send a clear message to the future of Cambodia. Thank you, Ronald. The President, the Chamber will give the floor next to the Defence Council to respond, to have their final response. But uh, in order that uh, their response is not cut uh, by the break, uh, then the chamber would wish to take the morning adjournment for 20 minutes. At 10.30, the session will be resumed.